like to welcome Dr. Ginger Sabley. <laughs> okay, hi, hi everybody. Wow, this is a little low for me, wait a minute. <laughs> Well, good to see everybody. Again, I recognize so many of you from previous years, and if I have not met you yet, please come and introduce yourself some time during one of the breaks. I would love to meet all of you, but it's nice to see all the familiar faces. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the clinical diagnosis of Morgellons disease because I often um, you know, do have a lot of people write me emails, and they'll say, can I come in for a test? to see if I actually have Morgellons disease. And of course, we don't really have a test. And uh, it's a little more complicated than, um, than just simply, like a lot of other illnesses, it's very easy. You just go in and take a test and you find out whether you have something or not. But many diseases don't have tests and we have clinical diagnostic criteria for those diseases. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. But first, um, for those of you who don't know me and and know my story in this. I was just gonna tell you a little bit about my journey with this. Um, I was trained in primary care, but I always had a particular interest in chronic fatigue syndrome, otherwise known as CFIDS, chronic fatigue immune deficiency syndrome. And I was uh, working with a lot of patients with this, but not really, basically just trying to help them feel better because none of us knew exactly what was causing it or how to treat it. So it was a lot of, of just basically a lot of reassurance and helping people feel better and deal with uh, symptoms. At the same time, I, uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. William Harvey in Houston, Texas, was also involved in treating chronic fatigue syndrome. And I met him at a conference in San Francisco in 1996. And being fellow Texans, we sort of bonded right off as, as Texans often do. And uh, we stayed in touch and uh, compared notes a lot with our patients. And he was the one who all of a sudden realized, wait a minute, these patients have Lyme disease. And he started testing his patients and treating them for Lyme. And he contacted me and said, wow, we have to start looking into this because I think a lot of these patients of ours actually do have a tick-borne disease. And this is something we can treat with antibiotics. So by 2003, I was a primary care provider with many Lyme patients here, right here in Austin, Texas, because although I moved away from Austin five years ago, I did live here for 34 years, and, um, and I practiced here for a long time. So when I was treating the Lyme patients, I would have a subset of patients that would come in, and they looked something like this uh, in various parts of their body. They would have these open lesions, and of course, when I would see these, I would say, well, what, what's going on here? Did, did you just scratch yourself really hard? Did you get a lot of mosquito bites and scratch them? And consistently, they would be saying to me, no, these just spontaneously appear like this. I didn't do anything to make these. And they, they're very slow healing. And, but the weirdest part is that these lesions contain these different kind of filaments of different colors and other exudates, other things come out of these lesions. And so it was a very bizarre thing I was starting to hear about. And these same patients, when you question them further, they had a lot of other unusual symptoms too. They had feelings of biting and stinging and crawling under their skin. And they talked about kind of a slimy or waxy film to their skin. Their hair changed in texture, and they would all say things to me like, my hair all of a sudden is not my hair anymore, it's, it's different. And uh, they had a lot of hair loss. They would have black specks on their skin, and they weren't sure what these were, but I could see them too. They were little tiny granules of black. And things that looked like seeds, we didn't know what else to call them but seeds, because they looked like seeds. And kind of gelatinous material, all these things. And, then they would spontaneously get scratches or even splits in their skin. And all of these things, and all these people were having the same cluster of symptoms. It was very peculiar. So at first it kind of sounded crazy, but I started looking more carefully and started to look with, with magnification and could in fact see these things they were talking about, uh, the filaments of the different colors under the uh, skin and sometimes protruding from the skin. Uh, the black specks, I remember uh, so well, 
um, with uh, one of my patients, his mother is right here today. Um, I remember him showing me uh, that he had the black specks all over the palm of his hand and then he would brush them off and then I would sit there and watch as they would reappear. And you know, many times the hair on the back of my neck would stand up because I'd be like, wait, these are very unusual things that are happening. You know, what's going on here? And then I'd see the black liquid sometime coming out of the pores of the skin, a very thick black tar-like liquid. And of course, there was significant hair loss with patients. I had some that had gone completely bald. And um, these, uh, the thing that was very unusual and interesting to me about these lesions from the beginning was how they did not tend to get secondary infections. And you would totally expect that because, you know, it, when you see mosquito bites that have been scratched and they have that, that open skin look, one of the main things you worry about is them getting secondary infections. And that's how little children always get impetigo, get infections with staph or strep because staph and strep are resident bacteria on the skin, but sometimes when you open the skin, these will get in and, and create a kind of oozy, crusty kind of situation on these. Well, this was not happening, and that's, that was very peculiar. And in, in fact, um, the patients were always being accused of self-inflicting these, these wounds on their body, and if in fact they were self-inflicting them by scratching, why were none of them getting an impetigo or a secondary infection? Um, I was very impressed by the similarities. At that point, I you know, certainly hadn't done any research yet. There really wasn't any talk about this. It wasn't on the internet. You know, nobody was uh, you know, surfing the net and finding out about this. But I couldn't believe how all these different patients were telling me the exact same list of symptoms. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. That's the thing I think that got me immediately to be interested and want to pursue this more because I figured well, how could this diverse group of people from all over the state of Texas be telling me the same peculiar list of symptoms because it's not like they could look it up and memorize it online at that point. You didn't have a lot of um, Texas ranchers that you know, surf the net and, and tried to dream, <laughs> dream up uh, uh, illnesses to, to have. I mean, a lot of these people were, were hardworking guys. They'd just come in and go, I don't know what's going on here, but something weird is happening with me. And um, so it, it was hard for me to buy into what some of my colleagues were saying, that these were all hypochondriacs, because it just did, didn't make sense. So about 2004, an Austin TV news reporter, Jim Bergamo, um, he became intrigued with all of this after I talked to him about it, and so he did a story for the evening news. Uh, he, he called it Under My Skin and um, played the Frank Sinatra song in the background, <laughs> Under My Skin. And he actually won an award for investigative reporting for this. Um, and at the time that it showed in the Austin News, uh, I guess, you know, sort of the proverbial, the switchboards were jammed the next day, you know. I mean, in our clinic, um, they just, it was just call after call the next day because all these people had seen it and people who were sort of in the closet with this disease had the symptoms but were afraid to talk about them because they had either already been told that they were crazy or were afraid that they would be told they were crazy. So they were very excited to see something about this on the news and of course they were also excited to know that they were not alone that there were other people out there with their same symptoms and um, so this is where a big influx of patients started coming in they all you know reported the same symptoms and they they all wanted help you know so i kind of was like, well, I don't really know what to do with all these people because I don't, I'm not an expert on this and I, nobody knew what was causing it. But since I had first seen it in a subset of my Lyme patients, it kind of seemed like the logical thing to do to go ahead and test these people for Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases that we also treat like Babesia, Bartonella, or Lichia, Anaplasma. And, and other, uh, other kind of infections, too, that, that challenge the immune system. And, and sure enough, many of them, a uh, majority of them, ended up testing positive for one of, at least one of these 
tick-borne infections. And so what I would, the way I proceeded at first was simply to treat their underlying infection that I could identify and I knew. And in most cases, uh, the Morgellon symptoms started to get better and go away. Um, so all of a sudden, here I was, this sort of Morgellons doctor, and I didn't really sign up for this, but uh, you know, it just kind of started happening. Um, and many of the patients improved, which was, of course, very exciting and rewarding when that happened. But what I started to realize is a lot of them weren't. And um, it, it, it wasn't really clear cut. It certainly wasn't a matter of, oh, let's treat Lyme disease, and then they'll get better. Uh, there were, so I, I started branching out and trying all different kinds of treatments that um, included pretty much every kind of anti-infective there was, uh, anti-protozoal um, medications and antifungals and antivirals, and we just kept trying everything just to see what would help. And of course, I was greatly criticized by many of my my peers because they were like, well, you're just throwing things at these people not knowing what they really have. And, uh, you know, that's not very responsible and that's not very good medicine. You know, you, you, can't just, <laughs> you can't just throw things at people and hope something will work. And I'd be like, well, what, what's your suggestion? <laughs> you know, and they'd say, well, well you, you have to just tell those patients to just wait till we figure this out. And I mean, I said, well, that could be 20 years or who knows how long. And so you're just going to let them suffer, you know? And so that they didn't, never had a really good answer for that. But uh, so that, that's what we started to do, just kind of starting trying different things and, and, and narrowing down what seemed to help the most. And I did a study at one point where on, on 122 of my clinically confirmed cases of Morgellons, and when I say clinically confirmed, it means that I personally had observed the typical filaments under their skin. And when I, when I did that uh, study, what I found to be the top 10 symptoms that were uh, specific to Morgellons disease, in other words, I didn't include symptoms that may have been due to some other, you know, coexisting pathology they had. But these top 10 symptoms were the crawling sensations under the skin, which they all had, the spontaneously appearing slow healing lesions, hyperpigmented scars when the lesions healed, intense itching even before the lesions appeared, seed-like objects coming out of the skin, black specks appearing on the skin, um, symptoms worse when the patient was hot, uh, fuzz balls, that's what everybody just calls them, little fuzz balls, blue or white or black um, on the skin, and then the thin thread-like fibers or filaments under the skin, and all, comp all patients complain their symptoms were worse at night, which is actually true of every kind of uh, skin condition you can think of. When I've researched all of these, everybody it doesn't matter what kind of itchy skin condition you have, symptoms are always worse at night. So the thing about the Morgellons patients, though, is that almost all of them, not all, but about 97% have the systemic symptoms, too, that make them just sick. They're uh, very tired. They have malaise, which just means a feeling of, eh, you know, not feeling good. Uh, trouble concentrating, brain fog, insomnia, muscle aches, joint pain, new onset of anxiety or panic attacks, neuropathies, muscle twitching. I mean, actually, the list goes on and on and on. But um, in other words, these people were, were really literally sick and, and, and pretty disabled, you know. Many of them were in bed most of the time, uh, could not work anymore, couldn't function anymore. Now, people were being routinely misdiagnosed, of course, and uh, the number one misdiagnosis, which everybody in this room probably doesn't need an explanation of, I'm sure you've all heard it, is delusions of parasitosis. And this is something that med students uh, learn about in school. They're basically taught, hey, if anybody brings in a little box of lint, 
stuff. You know, that's the matchbox sign. They're de delusional. They, they think they have parasites, even though the patients very often don't even mention the word parasite and actually don't even think they have parasites. They just know that they have filaments coming out of their body and they bring them in. And so this is what doctors are taught, just to say, okay, you have delusions of parasitosis without even really examining the skin to see if maybe there's something going on there, right? Uh, of course, the other thing is um, when they come in with all of these lesions and the patient says, okay, well then fine, so why is, why is this happening to my skin? They'll say, well, that's self-mutilation. You're doing that to yourself. You're just tearing your skin up. And so that's the other thing. Um, of course, very often they're being misdiagnosed with methamphetamine abuse, kind of this is often called meth mites, you know, because uh, people on meth sometimes have this sensation of crawling all over and they feel like there's bugs under their skin and they tear at their skin trying to release these, these bugs. Uh, I, I, a lot of people were uh, diagnosed with scabies or lice, which um, little confusing to me because it's kind of st a stretch. The, the, certainly these Morgellons lesions did not look anything like typical scabies lesions, but I think some doctors at least were like, you know, hey, I can see you're suffering here, so shoot, maybe you have scabies. Let's just give you something from that. And then in terms of the systemic symptoms, people were being routinely diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. And as you know, those are just kind of what I call wastebasket diagnoses. They're really just names for symptom complexes, not actual diagnoses. They're just like, okay, all you people all have these symptoms, so let's give you a name. And, and that's what they do with things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, um, I went through a rather um, stressful and rigorous three-year investigation uh, by my regulatory board because I was um, doing things that were not highly looked upon by some of my colleagues. It's a very conservative uh, climate of practicing medicine in Texas. And I see uh, one of our Texas doctors grinning over there. And um, he's been through uh, quite a bit of it himself. And so after um, this uh, long investigation, I, um, I really just didn't feel comfortable, uh, even though they actually exonerated me from everything. But it was such a stressful time that I then started working in San Francisco in the practice of Dr. Raphael Stricker, who was another Lyme doctor. And um, I just felt like it was going to be a little bit safer for me there. California had a little bit more understanding of thinking outside the box. They had a lot of naturopaths and alternative practitioners. So they're a little bit more open-minded about people doing things, you know, just, just a little bit differently. So, so um, when I first went there, Dr. Stricker didn't believe in Morgellons and didn't know anything about it. And so I was trying to work to convince him about it. And uh, so every time I'd see a patient and I, I'd, I'd see something unusual, I would actually interrupt him uh, from his patient and say, look, you have to come in here. Because I, I wanted him to see what I was talking about. And I think with this, it's seeing is believing, you know. And when, once uh, I can get an, a doctor to actually look and pay attention, they're going to have to stop and kind of go, wow, because how could they not? I mean, there's some pretty unusual things that you're seeing. So I would, um, I would do that with him. And uh, of course, he got to the point where he couldn't really deny the reality of the disease either after what, what uh, he was seeing. So then I started helping him treat the patients. He started helping Morgellons patients too. And then the goal was, well, let's get more doctors to look and to pay attention. But that was the hard thing. And when I had colleagues call me and um, dermatologists would call me and yell at me and stuff, and I'd say, well, you know, have you actually really looked, you know, using magnification? Because, I mean, there, there's some, and they're like, of course I'm not going to look. And those patients are delusional. I'm not going to buy into that, and I'm not going to give them the satisfaction of, uh, of looking. <laughs> I'll be a well, you know, how, how can you say these things? So, you know, I always uh, love this quote by our colleague, uh, you know, Richard Shoemaker, in the face of obvious abnormalities, skepticism is inappropriate, right? So um, 
whenever you have a, uh, a disease for which there is no known pathogen and no, therefore no lab test, um, you have to be, uh, you have to develop a clinical case definition. Um, we, we don't have a lab test for Morgellons disease. People can be tested for Lyme and other tick-borne diseases and that have been associated with Morgellons, but this doesn't prove they have Morgellons because obviously lots of people test positive for Lyme that don't have Morgellons. I mean, we got a, I treat a ton of them. <laughs> I mean, I treat a lot of Lyme patients and um, two studies have shown that about 6% of Lyme patients go on to develop Morgellons disease. So who knows why that is at this point, but obviously a lot of people have Lyme without having Morgellons. So um, like I said earlier, all diseases that with, a, with an unknown etiology that hasn't really been proven, uh, a clinical case definition is developed based on criteria established by a consensus of experts in the field. That's the way it's always done. Uh, so, for example, chronic fatigue, immune deficiency syndrome, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, Gulf War syndrome. These are among the diseases for which clinical case definitions have been established. This way you give, you give doctors a way to be able to, to diagnose something. And the criteria for, for the clinical case definition have to be specific and unique to the disease. For example, you wouldn't want itching to be a criterion because it's, it's a very common and, and it's common to many other conditions, skin conditions, systemic conditions, so it's not specific enough to, to the disease. So what we need to ask ourselves is what is absolutely unique to Morgellons disease? Well, is it the slow healing lesions well, not really, because there are many different skin diseases and, and, and systemic diseases that have lesions look kind of similar, maybe slightly different, but lesions per se is not really uh, a very specific thing to this disease. And this could be a whole separate talk here, but I do go into it in my book. Uh, the differential diagnosis and all the various skin diseases that could have lesions that look somewhat like the lesions of Morgellons disease. So um, the other thing we have to ask, okay, are the lesions necessary for a Morgellons diagnosis? Well, no, because I have plenty of Morgellons patients that don't have lesions, that never had any lesions. And I haven't figured out the exact percentage yet, but I'd say about 15% of my um, Morgellons patients don't have lesions. And so we can't make that a diagnostic criteria because it's not, you know, that's not always the case. Um, so another possible diagnostic criteria is that the feeling of crawling and biting under the skin. Well, no, because people with paresthesias have those exact same sensations. Uh, caused by inflammatory irritation to the sensory nerves. Um, my Lyme patients that have no Morgellons have those exact sensations. Um, and also other systemic diseases like diabetes, MS, people with strokes, people with certain tumors have um, the, the sensation, it's just their mind is tricking them, that there are uh, insects crawling on them, insects biting them, crawling under the skin. And I can remember very well, I never personally had Morgellons disease, but I remember back when I was really sick with Lyme disease, it would make me feel like a crazy person because I would constantly be feeling something biting me, and I'd look, and there was nothing there, but I could, it was just so much like a bite. And I could even feel, I remember I felt like spiders were crawling up my arm, and I'd look, and there was nothing, but I could feel it, I, I could have sworn there was a spider crawling up my arm. So those are, paresthesias. And like I say, those can happen with a lot of different kinds of conditions. So that really isn't unique uh, to the disease. So what about the systemic symptoms of fatigue, pain, brain fog, insomnia? Well, those are very nonspecific symptoms. Uh, those are all seen in, in many tick-borne diseases, but they're also seen in depression, hypothyroidism, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, diabetes, lupus, MS. So all of those systemic symptoms that we see are pretty nonspecific. They're not diagnostic in their own right, okay? Also, are these systemic symptoms necessary for a diagnosis? 
Well, no, they're not actually. I have three to four percent of my patients consistently have had absolutely no systemic symptoms. Uh, they uh, feel fine, they have no fatigue, sleep well at night, no pain. They are not sick, they don't feel sick, but they have all of the skin symptoms of Morgellons disease. And in a way, they're a little bit more challenging to treat because uh, I really hate to give those people a lot of antibiotics because they're not really sick people. Um, but they do have something that's driving them insane. You know, they've got the lesions, they've got the pain of the fibers coming out, and they have the, all of those other skin symptoms consistent with Morgellons disease, but they do not have the systemic uh, symptoms. So what is unique to this disease and therefore diagnostic of it? And it is clearly the keratin and collagen filaments that come out of the bodies of Morgellons patients. They sometimes protrude from the skin. They weave their way underneath the skin. They're difficult and painful to extract. And when my colleagues would say, oh, those people, they just stuck textile fibers in their lesions. Well, I said, well, have you ever tried pulling them out? Because, I mean, you can't. <laughs> and when they're very deeply embedded like that and they cause radiating pain to extract, it's pretty hard to believe that a patient could have, you know, stuck that in there. <laughs> So, and we all know, of course, that that's not the case at all. So the keratin collagen fi filaments are the unique distinguishing feature and, and are the diagnostic feature of the disease. So in my book that I have out here, um, and um, uh, you know, it's, it's been out now for a year and a half, I can't believe it, it's been out that long, but I do propose a, a clinical case definition in that book um, and more or less, uh, this sounds kind of like a fancy way to say it here, but a systemic condition with dermatologic features that's highly variable in presentation but involves the presence of organic filaments of human structural proteins that originate under the skin and weave through the dermis, under layer of skin or exit through the epidermis. So in other words, basically, just a fancy way of saying it's, it's the filament disease. It's got the, the unique characteristic is that there are these filaments made out of the body's own proteins. This is the book <laughs> that I'm talking about. We have some for sale out there. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so the key then to diagnosis, of course, is to identify the filaments. You know, um, when people say to me, can I come in and have a test? Or can, you know, no, basically what I'm doing for diagnosis is I'm looking carefully at the skin to identify the characteristic filaments under the skin. So if a doctor does not include a very detailed, careful look at the skin with light and magnification, there's no way they can diagnose this because that's the way you diagnose it. But the problem is it takes time and patience. And those of you who have these filaments know how it is that some days are good days and some are bad in terms of trying to find these things. And you have days where some a doctor could just put a scope anywhere on you and find the filaments immediately. And then you have other days where it's like, darn, where are they today? It's like they're in hiding now, you know? And, uh, and, and of course, naturally, it's like taking your car and when it has a squeak to the mechanic and, and it won't make the squeak anymore, a lot of times you go to the doctor and darn, the, where are the filaments now? No, nobody can see them. So, um, you know, it, it's a clearly, and I'm preaching to the choir for this to say this, is that it's an inappropriate to diagnose a psychiatric condition without a thorough exam of the skin first, because that's, uh, well, that's just irresponsible medicine. But it's been being done all the time, isn't it? So, now, of course, these filaments, they can't be seen with the naked eye, and a lot of the dermatologists are, are diagnosing people from 10 feet away, and uh, you, you can't do that. So um, you have to use light and magnification. The other thing, dermatologists traditionally will carry a scope in their pocket, maybe 10 to 12 time magnification, and maybe even if they do take that out and take a look, it's probably not gonna be a strong enough magnification to see what they need to see, so then they just write it off and say, nah, there's nothing there. I knew there was, and you're delusional. Um, the thing we found through the years, too, 
is that using an ultraviolet light, um, sometimes known as a black light, or in medicine we call it a woods lamp, uh, is very helpful. Uh, you know, the ultraviolet light is, is used traditionally in medicine to help diagnose fungal conditions because fungi do fluoresce uh, or kind of a shiny look that they get under the uh, ultraviolet light. Uh, but the interesting thing about the Morgellons filaments is they also tend to fluoresce under ultraviolet light, which caused us at the beginning to think, hmm, we must be looking at some new fungus here. Um, but through the years, we've certainly found out that this is not a fungus. Uh, that's been a very clear thing to find in the laboratory uh, work that has been done by the researchers. But because of the fact that the filaments fluoresce, it's kind of a helpful thing because when um, a lot of the doctors, when they're just looking, they'll, what they'll say is, oh, those, those are just hairs. That's hairs. That's nothing. Although they can't really explain the bright blue hairs, you know. But, um, but anyway, it does help when, when the fibers fluoresce because it makes them stand out from the hairs. And once the doctors do get in there and start looking, then, then they can very quickly start to discern the difference between these filaments and just the body's own hairs. But at first, this can be helpful. Um, this was a, a picture of me using the woods lamp. Uh, years ago, this was kind of funny, this, this was an article for Popular Mechanics, um, which was one of the earliest uh, magazines to do an article on Morgellons disease, of all things. Uh, you know, who, who'd have thunk it? Popular Mechanics, but uh, ahead of the crowd, you know. So, <laughs> we, we often use, a lot of us use, and probably a lot of you have, the ProScope. I, I, I swear I think they should be giving me a couple of free ones for all the advertising I do for these guys. <laughs> but they won't give me one. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, they're very expensive. Um, and so that's just a, an expensive way to look because you can see as, as you're looking, uh, as you place it on the skin, you'll be able to see the picture on the computer screen. And that's helpful so that everybody in the room can see. And sometimes uh, the patients off will bring along loved ones who are very skeptical about what they have. And it's very, very helpful when you can show that loved one of the patient. See, look at this. This is unusual. This is not normal. People don't have blue filaments coming out of their skin usually. So this is something you got to pay, pay attention to here. Of course, not everybody has the money to spend $400 to $800 on something like this. So there are also much, much, much more inexpensive good ways to look for it. And Cindy, this year, do we have those for sale out there? OK, we, we have the little, uh, little ones that are fantastic. I swear I still like using it in my office more than I like to use the fancy one. Um, they're, how much are they this year? They're $10, and they're, they're, they're very small pocket-sized things, and they work great because they even have a little ultraviolet light on them, which most of the time, if you just go to Radio Shack or someplace and buy a little magnified, lighted magnifier, you're not going to get that um, a little ultraviolet light. And so these, these are good ones, and um, we do have some here if you're interested. So... Um, some examples of the things that you will see, and particularly if we have any healthcare providers out there, I hope we do, that are trying to get interested in this. Um, this particular one here I have on the front of my book, I thought was uh, such a, an actual beautiful example of the kind of unusual filaments that you'll see just under the skin. And uh, you know, certainly anybody who sees something like this, can't say that this isn't a very unusual finding. I mean, you, you have to become fascinated in this when you see these things, but it, it still amazes us that we have people who are, are shown these things over and over uh, and they still won't believe. And one of those people was a speaker last year here. <laughs> you guys may remember that. <laughs> said that. <laughs> uh, somebody just said, did he get out alive? <laughs> nah, yeah, we were considering hiring bodyguards for that one, but um, 
Anyway, uh, no, it, no it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating to, the, to those of us who've been working with this for so long, how we can show some other doctors who are deniers, and man, they just, they, they keep on with the don denial, they really do. You know, and the, uh, the black filaments, of course, in a, in a lesion here. And then um, this one, well, this one's pretty magnified at about 100x, but the little octopus looking um, lesion up there, that's certainly not something you normally see when you look at a lesion under magnification. And of course, the kind of bluish, purplish type of uh, fiber that we see. A lot of times we see them uh, a bright turquoise color. Certainly seen a lot of filaments coming out from under the nails. And of course, the nails are made of keratin. And so it kind of makes sense if, 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 if this is in fact, and it looks like this uh, definitely is happening, that the, uh, we have hyperproliferation, uh, couldn't get that word out, hyperproliferation of the keratinocytes. So the keratinocytes that produce the nails on the body, they're just kind of going bonkers and going haywire here. So we get a lot of these filaments. Now, these are unusually long ones. I don't see them usually that long but I do often see a lot of filaments coming out from underneath the nails. And then um, we have the ones that patients often call feathers um, because they do, they look, they're, they're feather-like. And, and one thing that we have to be very careful about, and I emphasize this so much in my book, is the language that we use when we're talking to healthcare providers. Because I think <laughs> we tend to sometime use languages, language that is descriptive and, but we say it in a way that makes a, a, a healthcare provider immediately flip a switch in their brain and decide that we're crazy. So in other words, we don't ever wanna say I have feathers coming out of my skin. <laughs> we can say I have some filaments that have the vague resemblance of a feather, but you know, the, so you can be guaranteed if you say I have feathers coming out of my skin, they're just like, you know, the paddy wagons, they're calling them, you know, right away. Um, and here's another one coming out of the skin that has that feather-like appearance. And we often talk about the fuzz balls, and this is a greatly magnified fuzz ball where it's coming out about nine o'clock there. You can see where the point of origin from the skin. But the fuzz balls are definitely just the filaments, but just kind of loosely wound up. And just as the black specks that we see on the skin are tightly wound up filaments, and Dr. Wymore showed that beautifully at a conference a number of years ago where he brought in electron microscope photographs of the black specks, and you could clearly see that they were just tightly wound up balls of filaments. So they're not insects, <laughs> people often think they are, but no, they're just more of the filaments, but for some reason they come tightly wound up. I'm going to say a few comments about treatment just because I usually, if I don't, people say later that they wish I had because I, I have the dubious honor of, I guess, having treated more of these patients than anybody else. And, and um, so there, there are just a few comments that I, I do want to make uh, based on my clinical experience. And, you know, it's been a lot of trial and error but the frustrating part is each patient responds very differently. And so feedback from the patient is so crucial for me in treating them. I'm always telling people, you know, the longer I do this, the stupider I get. Because uh, every time I think I kind of have something figured out, you know, I just, it turns out that I don't. So it's, it's constantly a, a very humbling thing to do to try to treat this. And because there, every time I think I've, I've got something figured out, then, then something happens that makes me realize I don't. But clinically, I have noticed, uh, and, and it's, this is so important, education and reassurance is so important to patients because, and I know this, uh, please don't throw your rotten tomatoes at me right now, but I know a lot of you will disagree with me, but um, it, it, this is not contagious through casual contact. Um, if I can tell you right now, if anybody would have gotten it by now, it'd be me. I've had my hands on at least a thousand patients with this. I don't even wear gloves when I, when I examine uh, patients with this. And I, you know, when I do, it's for their protection, not mine, 
if I have a just a really bad open lesion, I will I will wear gloves for their protection. But I what I'm trying to say is I have no fear at all of uh, contracting this myself through one of my patients because the filaments and other exudates are not infective agents. They're basically debris that has come out of the patient, but they're not infective agents. Now, people will throw back at me. I know they always do. Well, you're wrong. You're wrong because my whole family got this, and I got it first, and then other people in my family got it, so you have to be wrong. But I still feel like, you know, there is a common contagion uh, source is, is, is one of the things that we're dealing with there. And many, many, many times I have patients who terrible, terrible cases of Morgellons disease who continue to sleep with their spouses, take care of their children, no one else in the family gets it. So um, it's, it's much more rare, actually. Um, well, my statistics show that 17% of people have, uh, that, that are sick with it have noted other family members have gotten it too. So um, I think there's more that we need to know about that, but I highly encourage people not to worry about things like just even sitting next to somebody on the airplane that they're going to get it from you. It's not going to be that kind of a casual contact uh, transmission. Also, no need to exhaust yourself in cleaning rituals and routines because the disease is inside you, not outside you. And so um, you can spend three hours a night cleaning your house, but that's not, not going to do anything but wear you out and your body's trying to heal, and uh, it just takes away val valuable energy from you with, that you need for, for healing. So I found that uh, treatment of Lyme disease usually gets rid of the Lyme symptoms, and the, the Lyme symptoms are the systemic symptoms of joint pain, muscle pain, fatigue, etc. But it doesn't get rid of the skin symptoms of Morgellons. Maybe makes them a little better, but treatment of Lyme has not been the key for me when, I, when I've done this through the years. Um, the treatment of the tick-borne disease, Bartonellosis, is always the key. And um, I don't know what this means. I'm not trying to say Bartonella causes Morgellons by any means. I don't know what it means. All I'm just basically giving you is my clinical experience. And my clinical experience shows me that when people really turn around and start to get better, is when I start to treat them for Bartonella, whether they have a positive test for it or not. And in fact, most don't have a positive test for it. But I go ahead and treat them with the antibiotics that I would use for Bartonella, and that's when they start to turn around. Um, some people, in addition of an antiparasitic, like Alinea, Metronidazole, or Tinidazole, can be helpful. Um, the anti-helminthics have been used quite a bit, and in some people, are game changers, other people, nothing. And those are things like ivermectin, albendazole, beltricide, thiabendazole, those, those sort of things. I've found in general that the penicillins and cephalosporins have very poor effectiveness against Morgellons disease. They're helpful for the Lyme symptoms. But you will have some impact, like if a person was, had no treatment at all and somebody all of a sudden gave them amoxicillin, I'm going to say probably the Morgellon symptoms would get a little bit better because I think, you know, you're, you're generally working away at their bacterial count and so the immune system is, is having a burden removed. But it's just not been the way, in my experience, to get people well with Morgellon's disease, to give them a penicillin or a cephalosporin. And, you know, you even, and Dr. Cornish is going to talk about this more later, and I'm so happy that she is, because it's such a huge part of this, is patients will not get well unless it's a very holistic, multifactorial treatment plan. You know, you absolutely have to stop smoking. You have to change your diet to eat cleaner and, and get off the junk foods. Um, you have to get away from any physically or emotionally toxic environment. Um, sometimes this is impossible to do, but it's something that has to be considered. There's a lot of other external stressors on a person that can really impact their immune system. Uh, anxiety and depression will also impact the immune system, and we have to sometimes treat that, even if only temporarily. 
And physical rehab and stress management are all important part of getting well too. And by saying that, I'm not saying this is a psychosomatic disease by any means. I'm just saying that any disease at all, even a bacterial infection, you're going to have more chance of working with a healthy immune system when you can uh, remove as many burdens as possible from the immune system. So it does take a long time to treat. Um, you know, you've got to plan on at least two years. And I have patients that have been with me two months and they're like, I'm not, get, I, I'm not getting that much better. I'm like, yeah, it, it, this is a slow moving process. You know, so it, you just, uh, as a healthcare provider, you, just, you become a cheerleader. You have to really, really just get people to hang in there and, and not give up because it, they will get better. It just takes a long time. So if you're not better after a few months of treatment, please don't give up hope because it, you, know, you will get there. And also, of course, symptoms do get worse in early treatment, which is another difficult part about this. Just as we know from treating Lyme patients and they get the Herxheimer reaction, the same thing happened with Morgellons patients. When you start to treat them, they will have a an increased amount of filaments coming out of their bodies, increased amount of crawling and biting sensations. And it's so awful sometimes that it's very hard to stick in there and hang in with the treatment because you're, well, wait a minute, I'm getting worse, not better. So that's something that just has to be, to be gotten through. And, uh, you know, the immune system's affected by your, your thoughts and your behaviors. And so anything that people can do, sometimes they have to go through therapy, um, uh, support groups are so, so helpful because I think people with Morgellons disease really do need to, to know there are others, other people out there like them. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on a little bit before I end is, is suicide because it's, it's a big, big problem uh, with this disease and I, it's the biggest risk for loss of life uh, in these patients. I had three current or former Morgellons disease patients take their own lives in this past year. I've had 10 uh, so far commit suicide uh, during the time that I've been treating this. And it's so important for patients to, to reach out for help if they have reached a point of feeling hopeless because, you know, there is hope and most people do get better. And so um, it's something that we all have to be very aware of and healthcare providers too kind, constantly uh, reassess for the risk of this. Sometimes it's our patients we least expect to commit suicide that do. And, um, oh, you know, I, I was talking about this recently with a patient about uh, one of my new patients, Morgellons patients, came to me. He said, I, I recently uh, kind of survived cancer. And he said, you know what? I'd 10 times rather have cancer than Morgellons disease. He said, when I had cancer, my family rallied around me. Everyone was so loving and wonderful. I had this supported doctor and team. I went to this clinic where they had a great support system and they took care of every aspect of everything and come back tomorrow and we'll talk about nutrition. And, you know, they were just, he, the way he put it, he, he said, I felt loved. He said, I felt very loved when I had cancer. But my patients with Morgellons feel the exact opposite. Everyone turns against them. You know, they lose their family and friends. Rather than the family rallying, their family basically rejects them. So they have no support system. They definitely don't feel the love at all. In fact, you know, so it's not hard to understand how this is a disease that can lead to a lot of suicide. Because when you just start to feel rejected by everyone around you, you know, there's no place to turn. And so, in speaking of this, I would like for us to think about, about and remember our friend Kelly Pickens, um, who took her life uh, this last year. Now, many of you may remember her from last year's conference. Kelly was a, a character. There's just no, no way around. But we, we, we loved her. She, she was a... She just spoke up and said whatever was on her mind. And if you were here last year, you probably heard her stand up and yell at that dermatologist and storm out of the room. And, um, you know, so she just didn't let, let anything by. And she, here's, here's something she had posted on her Facebook. 
And it's so Kelly, you know, I'm not rude. I just say what everyone else doesn't have the balls to say. <laughs> and that was so true of her, right? I mean, she just came right out and she just said it. She didn't worry about hurting anybody's feelings, you know. And, and again, sometimes you just don't know. I just, I would never have thought of Kelly to be, there's a lot of my patients I worry about when, in terms of suicide, but I, I, I just, you know, Kelly was such a strong force and uh, it, it just really was very shocking to all of us when she took her life. She, she made us laugh a lot and one of the things she did, here's, here's a t-shirt she had made up and, and she gave one of these to Cindy and she said, you're about to exceed the limitations of my medications. <laughs> And um, <laughs> we all love this one. I mean, it's, you know, who can't relate to that, right? So anyway, let's, let's remember her. She, she, was a, she was a fighter boy. She was a warrior. And, and um, she was a, uh, it's, it's just a sad, sad thing that we lost her. And it's still hard to believe. It's still hard to believe I can just see her now here. Last year, you know, she was such a presence. And and um, said all the things to that dermatologist that we all were dying to say, but <laughs> she said them. So, rest in peace. So, just to end up here, I'm gonna leave my contact information in case you want your healthcare provider to email me about more gel. I developed a, a, a treatment handout for other healthcare providers. Uh, I can't provide this directly to patients, but if you can have your doctor, if you find a doctor who's at least sympathetic, and believe me, more and more are, I am so excited about this one thing, I have to tell you, that's very exciting about the world of Morgellons right now. I get, every day now, I get emails from healthcare providers all around the country saying, I've got a patient, I'm sure they have Morgellons, I believe them, I want to help, what can I do? That's huge, right? Because it used to be, <laughs> they were all being told, you know, they were crazy, but hey, look, there's people that want to help, but they don't know what to do. So, so I've developed this thing that I can just send back to them. I mean, it's a little too simplistic. It's a very difficult disease to treat, but, but you know, at least it kind of gets them started uh, on, on knowing what to do to, to help people. So if you have somebody who's at least willing to reach out uh, to me for that, um, I would be happy to provide that for them and also give them any other help that they may need uh, as they go along and, and try to help you get past that, this. So thank you so much. I'm happy that you're here. I hope you learn a lot this weekend and, you know, enjoy the weekend.